Today we are inviting you to participate in a dialogue between two psychoanalysts. Uh, my name is Amira Simcha Alpern. I'm a licensed psychologist and a psychoanalyst. And I'm also the founder of The Potential Space, which is a center for education for psychotherapy. I'm also faculty in the Suffolk Institute for Psychotherapy and Psychoanalysis and in the Dernig Institute. I have the honor of exchanging idea today with Dr. Jerry Gargiulo. He's a psychoanalyst and a psychotherapist. Uh, he's the author of two books. One of them is uh, Psych, Self and Soul, Rethinking Psychoanalysis and Spirituality. The second book, which is the recent one, which is a more, it's a biography, it's Broken Father, Broken Sons. Dr. Gajulro is also a former president of the National Psychological Association for Psychoanalysis, what we call NPAP, which is in Greenwich Village, Manhattan. And he's also the co-founder of the International Forum for Psychoanalysis. He's a member of the American Psychoanalytic Association. So, Dr. Gajulo, I'm very, I was intrigued by your book, uh, Broken Fathers, Broken Son. It's rarely that we get a psychoanalyst reflecting on their life and writing autobiography the way you did. What made you decide to write this book? Many years ago, when I was completing my psychoanalytic training, I had the honor of taking the last course that Theodore Reich gave, a very, very famous uh, a follower of uh, an innovator in psychoanalysis. And uh, one thing always struck me about Reich, he was not afraid to speak about himself and to use himself in order to understand patients. He was very much against the proliferation of jargon and technical words. And he was very much against the hiding that for many years marked what a psychoanalyst was uh, uh, under the guise of neutrality. Uh, as if somehow the uh, analyst created the transference, not the patient. Okay? So uh, with that as a backdrop, I um, actually started writing the book about two years after my father passed away, and I did not intend to write a book. I intended merely to write uh, the first chapter, which I had called The Autobiography of Humpty Dumpty. Uh, I wrote that, and I showed it to a few people, and I was about to send it out to different journals, and a number of people said, please continue, please continue. Okay? And uh, so I decided that I would not only talk about my childhood, but I would talk about my 10 years as a Carmelite monk, about uh, leaving uh, the seminary, about meeting my beautiful wife, uh, becoming a lay professor of theology. But hopefully, and each reader will have to decide whether that's been achieved or not, Hopefully, that people can see that no matter what your childhood is, that uh, therapy, analysis, therapy, insight, directed therapy, as well as emotional, obviously, uh, can help heal us. That we are constantly growing, that we are constantly changing, that we don't have to be defined by our childhood, although we are molded by our childhood, but we're not defined by it. Okay? And I think that's one of the things psychoanalysis helps you understand. We don't give people new childhoods, but we give them ways of interpreting it so that it, it now is a more freeing experience rather than a confining experience. You know, it's interesting what, for those people who didn't read your book, you describe a very difficult childhood and a very strenuous relationship with your father. I think why I chose the title was out of actually forgiveness for my father. It's because I came to understand progressively that although I could be very hurt and angry at some of the things that happened to me, uh, that he was broken himself, that there wasn't a malicious passing on of unfortunate experiences. My father came to great understanding about himself at the end of his life, for which I'm very grateful, and that I was able to resolve a number of issues uh, from my childhood, and that's really good enough. Also, the metaphor of Humpty Dumpty, it's playful, I liked it very much, it's playful, but it also gave me a sense of something pessimistic that does some kind of injustice to your book because, you know, all the king horses and all con king men couldn't put Humpty to together again. Mm -hmm. And in a way, you put yourself together. Yes, yes. You yes. put it. Yes. I, uh, I think why I used it was to try to convey 
uh, the brokenness of my childhood. Mm -hmm. And I do say in the book that I was puzzled myself. What could it possibly mean that all the king's horses, horses, and all the king's men, okay? And I uh, liken the horses to anger, okay? And the men to interaction. Mm. Uh, that's really what I did. And so when one has difficulties in life, and we all have them, no one escapes, okay? One has to work out uh, love and anger, okay? Uh, and it's a task, and it's a worthy task, okay? It's, it's much more of a meaningful task than just the accumulation of things, which, which are certainly helpful, but not the goal of life. So let's go back a little bit. Let's go back to the childhood, and then we'll go with you along as your life unfolds, at least in the book. What was the most difficult, now from an adult point of view, when you look back at the child that you were, what was the challenging part of your relationship with your father? It took me a long time and my own analysis and my own experience in marriage and probably my own children that long to realize that my father did love me. But he was... So you fell unloved? I felt unloved, yeah. but that he was not able to convey it much. He didn't spit little bits and pieces, but that the, 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 he was shadowed by his own childhood. I know that. So I understood that. It took me a while to understand, and maybe it was having my own children to understand right, that you have to, that you must convey your love. He was terribly tied up, terribly bound by his own childhood. I, I was able, I, but I, I've never repudiated my father. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people are surprised when I say, you know, you can hate what a parent did to you. That doesn't mean you don't love them. Mm -hmm. Of course you love them, okay? But you don't have to deny what they did. So what did it leave you with that today? You know, this experience as a child, how did it form you as an adult today? Uh, uh, one has to, another point that you had asked me about when we were talking, Amira, where I wrote in the book, as we listen to our patients, we have to be writing our own autobiography. That's my favorite quote from That's, the book. That's, okay, but I believe that. In other words, if we're not identifying with the patient, if we can't somewhere inside of us, we don't merge with our patients, of course not. But if we can't uh, experience, to a certain extent, simultaneously their pain and their difficulty, then we're not gonna be able to hear them. We'll hear their words, but we won't really hear what they're saying. And I think some of the injuries that I had which were not horrendous, they were very difficult injuries, but they weren't horrendous injuries, uh, has enabled me to, to have that level of openness and to identify with patients. Mm -hmm. Let's go, let's not jump ahead. The, jump ahead. Right. Um, in Adu after a year of college, you decided to, to join the Carmelite Order right. and to study religion right. with the intention of being ordained as a priest. Correct. Can you share with us a little bit what led you to this decision? It's pretty unusual for a 18-year-old well, to make this decision. Well, I really yeah. think, in point of fact, that I was simply unprepared. I knew I was looking for supportive, loving father, even mother. Okay? I knew that I needed some healing, and I wasn't sure where to get it. Okay? And I knew that I was simply unprepared to jump into adulthood. Okay. You know, from all the substitute father figures, right. I liked Father Ernie the most. Oh, I loved Father And Ernie. I tell you why. Yeah. You know, he realized that you're different than him. You know, he probably was very committed yes. to the dis dis discipline yes. he was. But he realized that you're different than him. Yeah. And he allowed you to be different. He allowed this me to be different. This type of father that allows the son to mm. succeed in his own way. Correct. Even if it's different than you. Correct. So in a way that's much more heroic, yeah. paternal figure that somebody yeah. that's, you know, nur you know yeah. nur nurtures you to be like him. Right. So in right. a way, although he was so committed, he was able to see that you're different and give you permission. Yes. In fact, years later when we knew each other as adults and he read my Psyche, Self and Soul book, he was unhappy with it. Okay. Oh, what, what was that? Okay. What the, was the, the, the spirituality, the, the, the repudiation of the formal religion. I see. But he said, you have to do what you have to do and that's okay. okay? So there was, there it was again. And I would, I would just balance classical psychoanalytic uh, uh, terminology about Oedipal 
as to say, uh, what's involved there is not just Oedipal striving's competition with the father and identifying with the father, it's again whether the father is narcissistic. If a father is narcissistic and thinks that their the son has to be just like them and has to go into their profession and has to go to the school that they want, okay, that's a major problem. Yes. Not just the son's potential or, pop or possible Oedipal conflict with the father. Okay? I see a lot of problems with narcissistic parents who are not able, not, not that they're unwilling, I'm sure inside they're willing, but they're unable to really identify with something different in them. Yes. Okay? And dedicate themselves to the growth of something different. Let me ask you, because you know, we treat patients all the time, we right. have our own life. When we have difficult relationship with our parents, we tend to repeat it in our adult life. Mm -hmm. Many people come and they choose as a partner the same hurting <laughs> yes, parent yeah, right. as their own parents was, and right. the trauma repeats. Right. You, were, you were able to, to choose what we call a good object or right. a, a wife that will help you heal rather than right. get re-injured yeah. or re-traumatized. Yeah. How did you do that? What can you tell, you know, how can we as people choose partner that will heal us rather than re-traumatize us? Look, I was extraordinarily fortunate enough to meet my wife, Julia. But I was just remarkably lucky. We uh, understood each other deeply. And uh, the only thing I can say is we, we stood in one space. We didn't have two spaces, okay? We stood in one space. And she was, Amira, you're right, she was terrible fiercely protective of me, the way a, the way a father is, she's fiercely protective, caringly supportive of me, the way a mother is. What do you remember from your own analysis it, and what was the transforming uh, part of your experience? I think my analysis was enormously helpful. I'm not sure I just said... what way? It was helpful that one, I had an ins a man who was truly interested in helping me and in understanding me and not categorizing me. And at the end, as people's, people who happen to read the book, one of the primary turning points in the book, maybe six months before uh, my father passed away, with great sorrow and with great sincerity, he apologized to me and said to me, in effect, from age five years old, you were right, I did always favor your brother. Okay? What did it mean to you to hear that from The you? validation of my perceptions. Okay? Validation of my perceptions. Consequently, when I listen to patients, my first assumption, particularly beginning patients and they ask me what therapy is about, I tell them what I think it's about, which is it's becoming real. And if you're real, then you'll be able to be creative. And real means I feel competent, I feel respected, I feel heard. And if we feel real, then we can, following Freud's injunction, we can work and we can love and work. And this brings back to the focus how important it is uh, to, that somebody feels validated and affirmed. That's right. And that's what my analysis, my analysis helped me with that. Besides giving me insight into my own distortions and my own misreadings of things, of course, we all do that. that that's just standard, okay? Okay. People undermine, people minimize that, and mm -hmm. I, I think people who are not in our profession, so what it is, you th what is the therapist, the right. th therapists always agree with the patient, so yeah. what, 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 what kind of work do they do, and I yeah, think yeah. people minimize how important it is for a person to validate their perception, their feelings That's are right. real. One of the things that I like about the book is that it sends a message that if you have a trauma or a difficult childhood, or you didn't get what you need as a child, you're not doomed. That That's there, right. were, there can be other people in your life that can give you right. what you need if you just look. One of the reasons you decided to call it Broken Father's Broken Son is the recognition that we are all broken in some way. That's right. We never, you know, we are vulnerable, but we still That's okay. transcend and we are okay. And we're, we're okay, and it's okay to be broken. Okay, we don't have to pretend that we're not. That's what I mean by narcissism. There can be the narcissism of showing off, and there can be an internal narcissism of pretending that we're not injured. We are all injured, and that has to be a bridge. The goal in life is, you, are your injuries a bridge to other people, or are they a prison? Yes. And if you make them a prison, you're stuck with them. 
What are you going to do with them? Okay? You can just be angry or sad. If you make them a bridge, you're still going to be a little angry and sad, of course, but you're going to have a way of connecting. You're going to understand our commonality. So I'd like to talk a little bit about God, mm -hmm. because psychoanalysts tend not to talk about God. Yes. In about spirit. We stay away from it. We, we are stay mostly away from secular, God. we try right. to be right. rational. But let's talk about it because I'm wondering, you know, as, a, as an analyst, you know, you treat people with trauma that went through horrendous history. And some of them, is a personal history, and some of them are very resilient. Somehow they transcend and build right. a healthy life, choose appropriate partner. Some are not, but some are. And I always ask them, who was in your life that was a good, that who did you go to to get help and felt supported? And sometimes people have no human help. Human help. Yep. But they say to me that the God or the belief in God kept them together and helped them hope for a better future. There are two main traditions in theology. In the Western world, we've only been primarily exposed to one, which is what we call positive theology, where people make all kinds of positive statements about God. Okay? There is another tradition, equally old in the West, equally going back to the Middle Ages and even going back to Plotinus, early Greek philosophers, which is called negative theology, which is a, individuals have to find that quiet, place inside them where they can hear the, in a sense, the vibrancy of life, okay? where they know that they are connected with every other human being, where they know that in order to be real, one can't flee from that quiet place, one has to find it. Okay? In the first, in the book, Psyche, Self and Soul, I quote a great deal of what Meister Eckhart, 13th century Dominican philosopher, mystic. He said, don't worry about talking about God so much and describing what God is, okay? Uh, know that we have to have compassion, love, care, and generosity. And that if we do that, we will find that which transcends us, okay? And in finding that which transcends us, we will no longer feel alone. And I think as a psychoanalyst, I have no trouble with that, that belief. I do have trouble with our Western theistic notion of God, which unfortunately makes him either a, a watchmaker or an accountant. Okay? Something bad happens to people and people get angry at God as if he didn't make the watch correct and he should come in and correct it. That's not what reality shows us. Okay? Rather than we adding up our actions, rather than our actions affect who we are. Not, is God going to catch us doing something wrong and therefore punish us? I frankly think that's close to blasphemy because I don't think it helps people transcend themselves. And if the word means anything, it means our capacity to overcome our narcissism. You know, I live in a, a house with three or four mirrors in it, okay? And to get out of ourselves and find ourselves with and in other people. Now, what's your favorite part of the book? Well, world? if you allow me just two minutes, let me read the epilogue because mm -hmm. this I is... I would love you to read it. Okay. I am listening now to my musings as I hear the endless, mild-mannered waves of the ocean come home to their shores on this sunny September afternoon. Sitting as I am on a sparsely peopled Amagansett beach, knowing as we all know, that there are other private, seemingly separate selves sitting like me by water's edge. Millions of us listening to the waves, listening to ourselves, wanting, forgetting, killing, loving, talking to parents, forgetting our own names, finding consciousness, losing it to reverie, to violence, to drugs, to facts, needing the moment to stay for just a second longer, forgetting that we are close relatives with the seas which haunt us, engulf us, and feed us, seeking the humpty of our youth or our hopes, if we can still have them, and knowing that kings and armies pay us, 
Parents fade into forgotten tales. Facts deceive. And matter breaks repeatedly. And it is only in the touch of finger to finger that we can feel created because we let someone close. And in the telling of our common tale of Humpty's fall and rebirth, we know that consciousness is noble wherever its epiphany. And we owe each and every moment of its appearance the dignity of healing. That to me really sums up what I try to do. <laughs>